Hello everybody and welcome to another deck guide. It is June's monthly deck guide. Today I'm looking at a deck that Travis made. And I'm just going to tell you right now, right off the get-go, this is a very Travis deck. So buckle up and let's see how we're going to draw a bunch of cards and play practice makes perfect. So Travis called this deck Daisy Skillshare Program. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty much exactly what it says on the tin. You're going to draw cards to get more skills, play skills to get more cards, use those cards to play skills or help other people draw cards and play skills. And today, in Daisy's mind, everyone gets a skill card. It's like, you know, like that, the Oprah means like you get a card, you, or you get bees, you get bees, you get bees. But it's like everybody gets skill cards or skills or cards with this Daisy Walker deck. So like at its core, this deck is pretty much still just like a, a it's a secret deck. You're going to be getting clues, but we're going to be trying to get as much power as we can out of our skill cards and try to like basically just be always drawing cards and getting skills when we're not investigating and discovering clues in this. This does have a lot of packs. This is actually probably one of the, the heaviest pack um, decks that we have on this. As well, there is going to be no level zero deck. We're looking at just the experience version that Travis made. Uh, but you can kind of like... Realistically, the through line from zero to what is 39, but could easily be 29 experience, uh, is a pretty simple through line to follow that you could just adapt. So as I said, these are all the packs that are required. Uh, as, as now is the case, the Dunwich Legacy and Path Carcosa, instead of listing individual... Um, individual cycle packs for them. I'm now just putting them as their deluxe box because that's the way they're shipping now, thank goodness. So, here is the deck. Um, we're gonna give it a preliminary look right now, but I'm gonna be going into the detail card breakdown and then talking about some other cards as well. But as you can see, the goal of this deck at its core is still just investigating. However, notably, the only thing that increases our book passively is Dr. Milan Christopher, who is still a 10 out of 10 banging ally. Otherwise, though, we're going to be using skill cards to our advantage to make up for, make up for passive increases instead by having skills that actually do good things. And then we're going to try to cycle through our deck quickly, or in the case of uh, Quantum Flux, as we see there, uh, it's going to cause cards to, like, we're going to, like, shuffle at the most opportune times. One thing that's also really cool with this deck is that this isn't just, like, a traditional Daisy deck. Where, you know, like, with Daisy deck, with Daisy you're looking at, like, the, the easiest plan is playing Old Book of Lore. Because it's basically just an actionless draw a card from the top three cards of your deck. Which is a pretty good deal. However, though, Travis, I imagine that this was an experimental deck and he wanted to see some other things. Uh, and see he did. See he did. There's a lot of cool things here as we go into breaking down the cards even deeper, which I will get to in a second. Um, there's no gameplay of this on our channel, but Travis did play this in our most recent epic multiplayer day with patrons uh, when we played Labyrinths of Lunacy. So the deck had a good time, and uh, I think that the deck is kind of neat, and I'm excited to share it with you all today. So why don't we dive in and start looking at the cards individually and start talking about them. All right. So here are two of our tomes, Dream Diary, Dreams of an Explorer, notably, and Esoteric Atlas. So Dream Diary gives us a skill to use each turn, and the Dreams of an Explorer version is a direct benefit to us because we are looking at being on high shred locations. As I said, this deck is lacking on passive skill boosts, so Travis is making up for that with something like the Dream Diary, which just basically gives you a passive plus two to a skill test. While in, like, you're gonna probably use it for investigating in this deck. As I said, this deck's goal is still investigation. And when you're on a high stride location where you need to have a bit more, like, to make up for even less passive boosts, Essence of the Dream now commits for four instead. Esoteric Atlas is a tome of choice in our deck to reduce our need to move, allowing us to spend more time investigating, drawing cards, investigating, and drawing cards. This is actually a nice choice here. So Esoteric Atlas, this Daisy deck isn't looking at using her ability like 
the same way as I said with Old Book of Lore, we're trying to use it every turn to just get advantage. With this one, it's kind of just like, there is a card, Scroll of Prophecy, that we're going to see next, which is something that you can, like, use pretty commonly every turn until it's out of secrets. But this Esoteric Atlas does a really good job at what you are going to lose on actions because you're going to be drawing cards and you're going to want to spend time drawing cards. Your Esoteric Atlas is going to swallow a lot of your movement, right? So, like, say, for example... Instead of moving twice to a location, you use Esoteric Atlas, and then in the actions that you saved, you draw cards and investigate. That's like the goal and the reason why Esoteric Atlas is here. And it also has Secrets, which is notable for Astounding Revelation, which is of course a three of in this deck. Otherworld Codex is another tome that Daisy's ability can benefit from. The Codex feels a bit bad when you miss while spending an action, but with Daisy we can use the Otherworld Codex for free, and it doesn't feel as bad if we miss. So, Otherworld Codex is an interesting card. I've playtested it, I've played with it, and I played it with Mandy, and it actually worked out pretty okay. Daisy doesn't get the advantage of searching 12 with Otherworld Codex, which actually does make a noticeable difference. However... It being a free action with her ability means that if you whiff, it's kind of just okay. It's kind of just fine. This is a way that you could uh, uh, solve problems that you draw, like an enemy. You can kill an enemy. It can get rid of a treachery card that's like uh, you don't want to have in your zone. It's a fun, it's a neat card. I think the fact that you can play the action for free does really boost up the card's value and kind of makes its weaknesses feel a little bit less weak. Scroll of Prophecy draws cards, and it can be free with Daisy's ability, which is a pretty good deal. As I said, this card is likely the one that you're going to use every turn, if you can, because uh, you can use it for free, and then it's just like drawing three, discarding one. That's a, that's a really good deal. And notably, both of these cards use secrets, so still be aware of Astounding Revelation and its ability to give these more uses. Notably, I'm not going to have a slide talking about Astounding Revelation, even though it's coming up a bunch. Because everyone, if you're watching this, you should know what Shocked Rabbi does. And if you don't know what Astounding Revelation does, you can find the deck list down in the description. You can find the card, click the card, and you'll be like, wow, this card seems pretty great. It is a good card. Ancestral Knowledge and Guided by the Unseen are two strong methods to give us skill cards. Ancestral Knowledge has five skills that we can draw throughout the game as needed, while Guided by the Unseen allows us to search during each test and commit that skill to that test if we spend a secret. Notably, Guided by the Unseen has another important function beyond getting skills. It also grants us an easy way to search for Astounding Revelation. So, with Guided by the Unseen and Astounding Rev, you can just, like, each test, pop off, an astound pop off Guided by the Unseen and try to dig out your Astounding Revelations you're going to hit them eventually. Like, there's just no way. You do not need to spend the secret to search. You can just search with Guided by the Unseen and spend the secret only if you want to commit the card. So even if it's empty, you can still just search for your Astounding Rev, which is pretty cool tech. Um, Ancestral Knowledge, while it is less of, like... Um, it, it, it'll eventually run out. It is just like draw five cards throughout the game. Like draw five specifically skill cards. They are random, but you can look at them. Uh, so you'll know what you want to be drawing. And like, it's just good. It's just like fine for this kind of deck. It's kind of what you want to be doing. Uh, notably, Guided by the Unseen does use secrets, but I do feel as though while committing the cards is definitely like really sweet. I think your other effects are probably stronger in the long term. However, with the way that this deck is going to draw and cycle and draw and cycle, your Guided by the Unseen may, may never run out because if you're just like, yeah, I'll put some secrets on this with an Astounding Revelation, it's just, it's just like good value. Guided by the Unseen can also be used on other investigators, and that's where the I imagine some of the skill share program uh, came into effect for Travis's title for this. Feed the Mind can provide us with up to, th up to three cards for one action. Be aware that it isn't a tome. Even though it looks like a book, it's not a book. So Daisy doesn't get to use it for free. Uh, this card, while it does seem a little low impact, it also can potentially be three cards. 
It's also a test that you can use skills on, right? You can use your enraptured on this. You could use your perception on this, right? It does have a it does have a good place in this deck, albeit it definitely seems lower power. I still can understand why it's here. Just drawing cards is sweet. Drawing cards is sweet. And also, like, realistically, I imagine Travis also made this deck to test out a bunch of cards that he hasn't played too often to get another opinion on them, which is probably one of the best things you can do in Arkham, so keep trying out cards you haven't played before. Grizzly Totem is here. It makes the skills we commit to our skill test better, and if that test is successful, it provides a card, essentially replacing the skill that it made better. Your accessory slot is only Grizzly Totems, so it's not that competitive. You get a Grizzly Totem, you play it, you turn your skills into better skills, and you get more cards. Everything that you want to be doing with this deck. And of course, it wouldn't be a Travis deck without Practice Makes Perfect. This card is a powerful card that grants you more uses out of your powerful skills. It can also be used on, on other investigators' tests, so don't forget that aspect of the card. While if I'm looking at the skill icons of this card, 25, there's 25 books. There is also 21 wilds, notably on the Prophesy, the Eye of Truth, and the Promise of Power, which we're going to get to. So even if you're, the other investigators aren't doing a book test, but instead are just doing a test, you'll probably hit something with Practice Makes Perfect from your deck. Obviously, you need a lot of practice skills to make this card work. So let's check out the, the practice skills that Travis chose to put in here. You gotta love deduction. Deduction is a great way to gain clue tempo, so obviously it's a great target for practice makes perfect and a strong skill in general. What's better than playing... What's okay? Here's, here's the math equation, right? What's better than gaining one clue? Gaining two clues. What's better than gaining two clues? Potentially gaining three clues. What's better than one deduction? Yeah, two deductions. So make a double use out of your deduction is really nice. In Rapture is another method this deck has for placing secrets on our assets, so being able to play one copy twice is very strong. This one also works well, as I was saying, for Feed the Mind, where you can fill out your other secrets, and it's just like, it's just a nice practice card. And Perception, while less exciting than Deduction and Enraptured, is still a good skill and feels great to hit on Practice Makes Perfect. It replaces itself, and that's kind of like the goal for what this deck wants. Sorry, just drinking some water. Promise of Power is a great way to pass pretty much any test. It's also a staple, so there's no surprise it's here. Travis loves Promise of Power. I love Promise of Power. Everyone loves Promise of Power. And this is an example of what I was saying for using Practice Makes Perfect on other people because it represents four icons for any test. And if it's like a rogue trying to get rid of a Frozen in Fear, you say, worry not, my friend. I have a Promise of Power and even an Eye of Truth in this deck. Prophesy is a neat practice skill that scales with the game. The more Doom and Play, the better it is. When do you want to pass a really important test? When the scenario is close to ending, and Prophesy is perfect for that. I know Travis likes Prophesy a lot, and while I've never played it personally, apart from like a, like, a, like one or two times, uh, I've seen Travis play it a few times, and the card puts up. Like, the card does work. So I think it, like, I understand why it's here. Number one, it's practiced. Number two, it's a wild icon, so it can help anybody. But the most important thing is that it's just good. It's just a good card. Like, it's just a good practice skill card. It scales really well, and it can have the same impact throughout the whole thing. Because, like, odds are, as I say, when you're making a very important skill test, you really want it to pass, and that's usually at the tension point of the game in which you have seven doom in play and like you need to do this in two turns. And that's when Prophesy is at its best, when you are the most desperate to pass your tests. And finally, there's the Eye of Truth. It's the Eye of Truth. When you fish it out with Practice Makes Perfect, it allows you to pass that test and hold until you draw that pesky treachery card. So if we go back to Practice Makes Perfect, after this test ends, if it was successful, add that skill to your hand instead of discarding it. This means that you could Practice Makes Perfect, you can grab the Eye of Truth, pass the test, and assuming it wasn't on a treachery, you can then keep the Eye of Truth in your hand for the next treachery that shows up. And that's pretty neat. 
So those are like the notable cards. I have a few more I'm going to talk about. But as I was saying how this is a 39 experience deck, which is pretty pricey. Your Eye of Truths could be something else. Like those could be like level zero cards, like assuming you're at 29. It's just like the card's fun and good and the art's great. So it's like great to look at. Uh, so it is the 10 experience that changes this from 29 to 39, just for reference. Some other cards that I did not talk about, Dr. Milan, he gives you plus one books and he gives you resources to pay for the things that you want to play. Luckily, this deck has like a lot of skill cards. So like the idea of the deck is that you get all of your assets out and then you just start cycling through your deck and playing the hell out of your skill cards. So um, the Dr. Milan is good at giving you some resources to pay for those things and then potentially pay for more things as it comes later on. Uh, Research Librarian is a must in like a daisy deck. <laughs> you have, uh, as, you, as you notice, the four tomes we have, Dream Diary, Esoteric Atlas, the Codex, and Scroll, those are all one-ups, which means that the Research Librarian is essentially acting as your tutor to grab the one that you want. So like if you keep, if you find a Research Librarian in your opening hand, don't get rid of it. One thing that is really good to say that's also notable about this deck is that because your card draw potential is so high, you're likely to find your, coat, your tote bag very easily, which means that you'll be able to play all four of your books when it comes time to cycle through your deck, and then you can really start taking advantage of the astounding revelations to fill things up with secrets and never, ever, ever stop. I talked a lot about Astounding Revelation. As I said, the card's really good. If you don't know what the card does, go just open up the Arkham DB link in the description. I do have it here, so also that you can like research and like look at the deck as I'm talking about the cards and read what other people say in the reviews, which if you don't read the Arkham reviews, you should, the Arkham DB reviews. There's a lot of great information that you can find in those cards, which is really sweet. We then have Read the Signs. This is just basically like a clue tempo increase, please. You add your brain to your book, so you have eight. You're going to pass the test and get more clues. Last notable card here is Quantum Flux, which may seem a little strange, but you can use it at, like, opportune moments. Like, say you know you're about to get rid of your Necronomicon. You could shuffle your entire discard pile into your deck, draw a card, and then get rid of your Necronomicon, meaning that you'll have a whole cycle of your deck before it comes time to uh, shuffle your deck again which means that your Necronomicon is going to sit in your discard pile for a very long time and you won't come through the cycle again. Because that's the, the one side here of the Necronomicon is that a lot of the times you play Daisy, you kind of just accept the Necronomicon is going to be in play. This deck has a way for you to get rid of it and then like put off seeing it again for a good chunk of time, which is really nice. Travis may have had another use for Quantum Flux that I do not see. But this is where I'm, what I see for Quantum Flux right now, and I think the card is a very neat choice. And also, I've never noticed the cues on Arkham DB before, which you should definitely check out if you have not seen them. <laughs> All right. Well, that's another deck guide for the month of June. Uh, I'm excited to see what we're going to have for July for you. But thanks, Travis, for building this deck. I'm going to actually play this one myself. I want to try it out, and I want to see how Skillshare Daisy is going to do. Huge thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have any decks that you think were cool that you would want to see me cover in this series. I'm curious to check it out. I would love some uh, links from people in the, in the YouTube comments that could potentially inspire me to want to try out the deck and do, a series, uh, do a, an episode in this series on it. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one. And as always, a GG's.